Thanks for staying with us. Uh, we're still on the breakfast, on breakfast, um, on Plus TV Africa. <laughs> I think I need breakfast this morning. Okay, uh, we're being joined by uh, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal Kola. practitioner. Uh, Kolawole, yeah, a, a legal practitioner here in Lagos. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, my brother. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe okay. I should order a breakfast from you. Yeah, I, maybe I need it. I've been calling breakfast where I should be calling other words. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's begin with the Punch newspaper. Um, in the small time that we have, let's look at some of these headlines. We're starting not with the uh, big headline here because uh, we've been talking and overflogging this issue of the humanitarian ministry scandal. Um, we are beginning with Nigerians hail Tinubu as President Trim's foreign trips entourage. Uh, let me have your take on that. Development. Uh, you are now know that uh, most Nigerians uh, have been complaining that it is not economical to be having the kind of contingent that we usually have, or that the president usually have, or which most government agencies and parastatals usually have when they go outside the country to attend the seminars, conferences, and the, and the meetings. The height of that was the climate change, uh, that uh, conference that was well recently. Nigeria, I think, apart from China, or there about, had the second highest number of delegates. And when you send huge delegates like that, you pay for airfare, you pay for hotel accommodation, and you're also going to pay them out of station allowance in Leicester Coast and Northern. So all these things are bleeding the economy. And they kind of uh, make the cost of governance uh, uh, way, way high and very, very expensive. So if the president is cutting down on the number of uh, entourage or people that go outside for such functions now, that would mean that he has had the cries of the ordinary Nigeria and he's ready to, to, to amend or pull down uh, the cost of governance and also the number of people that go for such meetings. I think that is a positive one for the government. I miss the negative publicity that uh, has been coming from uh, the governance uh, of recent. Uh, there are two things also. I was just asking um, when we were taking our top trending. Uh, the numbers mm -hmm. also trimmed down of uh, people who will be moving in the entourage of the first lady and the second lady, as the case may be, the first lady being the wife of the president and the second yeah. being the wife of the vice president. These offices are not even captured in the constitution. Uh, so you're cutting down the number. Why not just wipe it off or at least make it official uh, so that we can put it in the constitution and know that, OK, legally, this is what we are doing. I was just asking what was the need of keeping an office that is not covered by the constitution and spending money as if... Uh, it is uh, an official thing that sh should be done. Well, let me quickly say that uh, it is not everything that should be in the Constitution. If everything is codified, uh, you're going to have a Constitution that's very, very unwieldy, that will now begin to look like uh, an encyclopedia. Uh, check, for example, the American Constitution. It's not about, I think, 15 pages or they are about very tough uh, sentences. Certain things are done by custom, certain things are done by uh, tradition, certain things are done by president, I mean president and what have you. I think the office of the first lady and some of the, uh, at the federal level and also at the state level is something that we have borrowed from the American people okay, in terms of, uh, do I say in terms of customs or in terms of precedent or in terms of practices that is um, uh, done in some of these places. Honestly speaking, I don't have anything against the offices of uh, first ladies and war have you. So long as they are, they are able to add value uh, to, 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 to governance. And yeah, and I do know some of them have very, very good programs for children, for women, for widows and war have you. All we need to do is to ensure that uh, the cost of running such offices and all that, uh, they are not uh, way, way out of what it should be. Yeah, but that something, something as important, future. Mr. Kola, well, something, very, very as important, yeah. something as important as the first lady, shouldn't it be covered yeah. by law? Because, okay, we've seen situations creeping into um, our national life where we've seen, uh, you see people driving cars or motorcycles or something, 
and the plate number is not carrying a plate number of any local government or any state. It's carrying broader to the uh, local government chairman. We've seen those things. We've seen uh, handles, uh, social media handles, carrying daughter of the president and so on and so <laughs> forth. Before you know what is happening, these things also will be allocated uh, some, some, some kind of uh, duties to do. So can't... I'm not, I'm not having a problem with the First Lady, but I'm having a problem with the fact that it's not covered by law, where you have to budget some money for an office that is not covered by law. And then we're talking like about said, transferring money to yeah. individual accounts. What's the difference? Like I said, uh, if everything has to be covered by law, the law will become very unwieldy. It will not begin to look like uh, an encyclopedia. And when it becomes uh, that unwieldy, enforcing the law becomes a little more uh, uh, difficult. It's not that we tend to abuse whatever we do around here, things like the office of first uh, daughter, office of first uh, uh, son and whatever. These are some of the activities that we can make up without codifying, without uh, making um, those into, into law. And for example, even you as an individual, you can have a customized plate number. Uh, I have seen, I think, one of the politicians uh, who's, uh, who has a private uh, card that uh, the plate number is customized. The, um, the Federal Road uh, uh, Service Commission have positions for that. They just make you pay some money to be able to customize your, 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 your plate numbers and what are those. Well, uh, anything that tends towards abuse, we can find a way to really uh, a call, call to things and, and what about. But like I said, certain things must be just done by citizens, by customs, mm. by uh, 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 practices and all that. We also borrow some of these things from other, other places of the world. So long as I said it's not a deal, uh, I think we should just accommodate those things. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the fear. Mm. The fear of abuse is what, because that same fear is what brought us to the electoral problems that we've been having, you know, because the law st stated some things and left other things for presidents, for discretion and all that, we got to a point where the discretion was to the negative. At least that's the, mm. uh, the uh, thought process of um, the average Nigerian, that it was, it was not good enough. Okay, but my, yeah, my other fear, my other fear, yeah. maybe yeah. is unfounded, is the fact that if the number is cut, which is a laudable thing, and I'm a, I applaud the, the, the president for this, uh, shouldn't they define the kind of people that should be on that uh, entourage going, uh, to, going around with these people? What, why I say this is that sometimes because of the ESTA codes involved, because of the monetary uh, enticement uh, involved, because of uh, uh, the, the fanfare and every other thing that is involved, the people that are the right people to move on this or in this uh, entourage do not get to go. It is the mm. high pl highly placed people who can fix their names and all that, even if they have nothing to do, that get to go. I give you an example. In Cross River State a few years ago, uh, all the commissioners and all the local government uh, chairmen went to France, including the governor and his deputy. They went to France to study. Um, uh, how to use bamboo to do a lot of things. Bamboo, okay, you, let's accept that bamboo is a miracle uh, crop as it is, and they use it for a lot of things uh, from uh, utensils and all that, but why would a local government chairman or a commissioner or a governor or deputy governor have to go to France when there are agri people there, extension officers are there, and so many other people that should have gone there to get the expertise, come back and make it function in their states. They didn't get to go. So most cases we see this. Now, when they cut the number, don't you see a situation where people who are not relevant for any mission will be the ones to go and not the ones that should go because it was not spelled out? That's my fear. Mm. Of course, I agree with you that you are right. Uh, most times uh, people see these things as an avenue uh, to, to, to make money. And most of the things that they go out there to study are not uh, quite useful. There are also things that they can even go on the internet and then they download videos of such processes and all that and then get to know the, the nitty-gritty or the know-how 
about some of those things at all. And like I like you said, this is the old officer that are relevant to what you want to know that ordinary men should be involved in such um, going outside to do some of these things and all that. But so long as those things become mere avenue for making money, uh, people who always want to agree that they will bend the rules and then smuggling the names of people who ordinarily shouldn't be part of such a entourage. The emphasis will always be that um, we should inculcate in those people responsible for governance, people in government, to cultivate financial discipline and let people who are relevant to some of these things be the ones that will actually be participating in some of those things. If you say you are going to uh, do a manual that the girls um, who could participate in certain things or the other, it will be very, very useful. But if they say the person is heading those ministries, uh, I've not cultivated the nature discipline, or see how the old mindset of doing this the way it is done, they will still do some of this, and they will see as this the process. They will just teach whatever manuals you have written, or whatever codifications or laws you have done, so we may ensure that it is people who are relevant that get to attend some of these workshops, meetings, and conference and all that. It is for us to really uh, begin to draw this in our people to continue financial decisions. If we are able to codify or do a manual and figure out how some of these things should be done, it will also be a very useful addition to getting the right things done in the right places. But we must continue to remember the ministry for the starters and order are usually different from one another. The Ministry of Health is different from the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Education is different from the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Work and order. So, to so sit down and do a manual that is able to prescribe what should be done in all the different places, ministry, para starters, and then uh, intergovernmental organizations could be sometimes uh, very, very uh, challenging and become a very hard work to task. Mm. Okay, uh, let's move to the Guardian newspaper and take one headline there. Uh, the headline says, uh, Nigeria's economy to grow at 3.3% in 2024, World Bank projects. 3.3%. I don't know if that is enough or that is good or that is bad. I, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts? No, it's not uh, good enough. Um, with the high rate of inflation we have in our hands, with the unemployment that's about 33% and all that. And then um, with the comatose uh, status of uh, our industries, the different manufacturing companies and all that, well. Nigeria requires to push GDP far, far below the 3.6% that the World Bank or whatever you say it's going to go. Anything short of um, 7 percent and above and, and what have you, may not be too useful for, for, for the country. And it is possible for us to achieve something that is quite uh, high or higher than that, in the sense that um, if we're able to fix uh, the power infrastructure, if we are able to ensure the security and the land and water, if we are able to cultivate them and get the in governance uh, to do the right things at the right time and all that, Nigeria's GDP should be able to grow more than what the World Bank is projecting. In fact, in my humble opinion, uh, we should be looking at nothing, nothing less than between 7 to 10 percent. If we are going to cut down on unemployment, if we are going to get the industry to get back to work, if we are going to be able to, 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 to do a lot of other things that this economy requires to be done, or it to begin to go once again. Okay. Uh, well, let, let's move to another newspaper, but um, this time Nature News. Nature News uh, leads with the story by Elsa Governor criticizes government's pipeline protection deal with Tompolo's security outfit. Now, on the one hand, uh, people say it shouldn't have been given to a private security outfit because we have Nigeria police, civil defense, uh, Peace Corps, and the rest of that. Uh, we also have, on the other hand, uh, the fact that we are short-staffed, as it were, when we talk about our security personnel and the fact that some of them even are colluding with the so-called uh, pirates, the so-called vandals, the so-called uh, people who are 
uh, uh, making us not to have as much oil as we should have in Nigeria. So what is your take? Where do you stand? Uh, he's saying they shouldn't have given to Tompolo, and um, we are seeing the challenges and the, the reality on ground. But what do you think? Well, Nigeria is a very interesting country. Uh, Nigeria is really to a paradox uh, of, of, of a nation. Why do I say this? You ask yourself, what equipment does Tompolo have to really be able to police the, the, the oil sector in the Niger Delta? That the Nigerian Army, for example, that the Nigerian Navy, that the Nigerian police, that the DSS they don't they have, that you now have to give them the contract to begin to police uh, the oil industry in the Niger Delta. You also would ask yourself, since you started this uh, project uh, almost more than a year ago and know that, has it stopped uh, the test that is uh, going on with regard to the oil industry in the Niger Delta? The answer is no. For me, the reason that uh, that kind of huge Zumbo cut has been given to Tompolo is a uh, smart of indiscipline. Indiscipline and uh, is an indictment on the entire security forces of, of the nation. It is also in, in an indictment in the time of government that they would prefer that the private individual should be policing the Niger data or I mean, the oil or the oil in the Niger data rather than the security policies that we have uh, uh, all over the country. Well, uh, it's difficult to really appreciate some of these things or to really understand the reason behind it. But what it tells me is that um, the nation or the government of government have no confidence in his own security forces. They are in the police and all that. Because if it has confidence, what he should do is to equip those security forces and empower them to be able to do the need to regard to policing the oil industry in the Niger Delta. Say, for example, a country like Saudi Arabia, like Kuwait, and some of these places, you wouldn't find the amount of security that we have in our own uh, uh, oil sector in those uh, countries. In Saudi Arabia, for example, I do know only a few security people you find where the oil wells are located. And then the piping and what happens. All they simply do is to install sophisticated security gadgets in terms of CCTV cameras, satellites, and what have you. And then they have control on where right from the railway to where the ship is taking a delivery of those um, uh, good uh, petroleum and all that. They are able to see it uh, uh, in one uh, control room uh, somewhere. There should be no reason why that shouldn't be the case in Nigeria. But you see, uh, all these things boil down to one thing. The executive arm of government, the local government, the state government, there is no trust between all these people. And the local communities too, who think that they are not getting the debt from the oil that is derived or that is taken from their region, will find one way or the other to help themselves to some quantity of those oil and dollars. It could be seen in a way, um, uh, so to say, a kind of a protest against uh, the way and manner the oil industry is not adding value to those communities where these oils um, are taken. Uh, since uh, <laughs> time in memoria, we've had that of security agencies in the Niger Delta to really secure the oil uh, uh, wells and what have you. And we are saying woefully in that area, just as we have been failing in so many other areas of, um, of our national life. It is that uh, nobody is committed, or there is no serious commitment, there is no patriotism with regard to really securing the, the, the wealth of the nation. Because most Nigerians uh, are that we are one. Most Nigerians uh, are not patriotic. Most Nigerians think that um, uh, wherever they could lay hands on their own national kit, whether by stealing it, whether by commandeering, whether by sabotaging it and all that, they deserve to go ahead and do it because once the resource or once the oil money gets to a butcher, it's not going to make any difference in their, in, in their life or in the lives of the whole, whole uh, community. 
Okay, uh, we also have this story on the same Nature News uh, that Nigerian army uh, destroys 233 illegal refineries, apprehends 1,112 suspects. Well, that um, tells you or enforces uh, what has been saying that all the traditional uh, refining of oil is a very, very uh, big uh, industry in the Niger Delta. But why is this a big industry? It is a big industry because people are perceived as the own means of uh, livelihood. Because if you are also unable to provide employment for the people, if you are able to clean the environment to make sure they are able to farm and also be able to fish, and also that they don't live in uh, an environment that is uh, polluted, if uh, they know that when the oil is um, explored and taken, they, they as an individual, they as a community, will benefit from those things. The family will not be risking their lives to engage in those traditional refining of, um, of oil. The solution to some of these problems is to incorporate the host community into the oil industry, make sure that they have value for what is being taken from their soil and ensure that their children or that the young people in those places also get jobs in some of these places. Say, for example, if you are able to provide uh, housing, uh, free reduced housing, for that case, give to the people in those areas, their children to school free, have good uh, facilities in those places, uh, free, and uh, they are educated and they are able to know that it is the money from the oil that is providing those services to them. I am sure they will be more patriotic in the way and manner they will be relating okay. with the oil that is taking or that is given in their, in their community. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Kola Wale, for being a part of our program this morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, we'll be talking with Mr. Tunde Kolawole, a legal practitioner uh, here in Lagos State. We were reviewing the papers and uh, seeing what the headlines were. We couldn't finish all the papers, but we hope that you got the point. All right, we're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll be looking at the real cost of the ban on uh, foreign universities because of the certificate saga. Stay with us. <laughs>